Hi everybody, my name is Paul Nguma and in today's video we'll be going over drug-induced liver disease, which is also known as DILI for short. The main point that I would like all of you to get from this video is what exactly is DILI and what are the risk factors that put some patients more at risk to experience DILI than others, how to diagnose and recognize when a patient is experiencing DILI, and also learn to recognize the manifestation of DILI and to manage DILI in patients who are at the highest risk of experiencing it. The definition of drug-induced liver disease is this. Drug-induced liver injury can either be acute, depending on whether it is lasting for less than six months, or be chronic or whether it's lasting for more than six months. It usually occurs when a patient is taking certain medications that are known to cause DILI. There are two types of drug-induced liver disease. The first one is intrinsic. This type of injury is usually predictable and it occurs at high doses of known agents. For example, acetaminophen. That's why there is a limit of 4,000 milligrams per day. The second type of DILI is idiosyncratic. This type of injury is less common. This type of injury is usually really, really rare and only affect a certain individuals with certain types of risk factors and co or comorbidities. Now here are the risk factors. There are three different types of risk factors that can increase an individual's chances of experiencing this. The first class of risk factors are host related. The first one being age, patients that are too young or too old. For individuals that are too young, they are more at risk of receiving higher doses of medications that are known to cause DILI. And for the elderly population, we know that as we age, our organ function starts to decline and they're not the same as they used to be when we were young. Other host related risk factors include other comorbidities such as diabetes. Another risk factor is malnutrition. Underlying liver disease is another one as well as genetic polymorphism. And the perfect example of genetic polymorphism is the testing of the genetic variation in this gene right here, which is highly linked to hypersensitivity to an HIV medication, Ibacavir. Studies have shown that individuals who have this genetic variation are more prone to moderate to severe liver injury after taking abacavir for HIV therapy. So these are the host factors. The environmental risk factors that increases an individual's risk of experiencing DILI include excessive smoking. It also includes the excessive consumption of alcoholic beverages. The ethanol from alcoholic beverages is metabolized by the liver and when it's metabolized by the liver, it turns into a very toxic intermediate such as acetaldehyde as shown right here which is very toxic to liver cells and can cause liver injury and even liver failure. Other environmental factors include infections such as hepatitis A, B, and C. The last classification of risk factors are drug related. For example, a high dose of a drug that's known to cause liver injury, such as taking Tylenol 5000 mg per day. Another one is the concurrent use of two, three, or four different medications that are metabolized by the liver or by the same SIP enzyme produced by the liver. And the last drug-related risk factor is the pharmacokinetics of the drug itself, especially the hepatic clearance of the drug. The symptoms that you should be looking out for in patients who are experiencing acute drug-induced liver injury are these right here. They may experience malice or discomfort. Um, Low-grade fever is another one anorexia which is linked to the malnutrition, nausea, vomiting, right upper quadrant pain which is exactly where the liver is, jaundice, yellowing of the skin or eyes, and extremely dark urine. Now the management of DILI is based on proper diagnosis of DILI. In order to diagnose DILI, the first thing you want to do is evaluate the medication list that the patient is on to see whether there are any medications that are known to cause liver injury and to see exactly when a patient started to take these medications so that we can establish a relationship between the offending agent and the onset of the liver injury. Another important part of the diagnosis is the evaluation of the liver function. The liver function test measures the value of the liver enzymes produced by the liver. And these enzymes are alanine aminotransferase or aspartate aminotransferase, along with bilirubin and alkaline phosphatase. If any of these three criteria that are listed below are found in the patient during the liver function test, then this may be indicative that the patient may be experiencing acute liver injury. If the patient's ALT is five times greater than the upper limit of normal, or if their ALP is greater than two times the upper limit of normal, 
or if there's a threefold increase over the upper limit of normal of ALT with a twofold increase in the upper limit of bilirubin, all of these different criteria are indicative of an acute liver injury in our patient. There are three classes of drug-induced liver injury that I want y'all to know. The first class is hepatocellular, and that is from the inflammation of the liver cells. The next class is cholestatic, that is from the impairment or reduction in the bioflow from the liver or from an obstruction in the bilateral tract as shown in this picture right here. The next class of daily can be a mixture of hepatocellular and cholestatic. A proposed method to determine which type of damage a patient is suffering from from the three different types of liver injury is stated in the guidelines for Dili by the American College of Gastroenterology. And that method is done by evaluating the liver enzyme abnormalities and by calculating the relationship between the ALT, the alanine aminotransferase, and the ALP, the alkaline phosphatase. That relationship is represented by the R value and the R value is defined as such. It is equal to the measured ALT from our patient divided by the upper limit of normal of the ALT. And then we take that number and then we divide that by the measured ALP over the upper limit of ALP. And if the calculation of the R value is greater than five, then there is a high probability that, that the type of liver injury we're dealing with is more hepatocellular if the R value is in between 2 and 5, then it indicates that there is a mixture of both cholestatic and hepatocellular. And if the calculated R value is less than 2, then this is indicative that the damage is more cholestatic and that there may be obstruction or damage in the bilateral tree. To make this easier to understand, we're going to look at an example, a case. A case where there is a patient who presents to the ED with signs of symptoms of liver injury, acute liver injury to be precise, and the liver enzymes have been measured in this patient and it turned out that this patient has an elevated ALT of 200 units per liter and an ALP of 90. And since we know that the upper limit of normal of alanine aminotransfer is around 40 and the upper limit of normal of alkanine phosphatase is 120, then we can plug these four values into our equation and we can clearly see that the R value, the relationship between the ALT and the ALP, is equal to 6.7. And according to the guidelines offered by the American College of Gastroenterology, an R value that is greater than 5 is more indicative of hepatocellular damage. Now for individuals with hepatocellular damage or mixed damage, the mixture of both hepatocellular and cholestatic, the first line tests that the guideline recommends to be performed are blood tests to make sure that there isn't any sign of acute viral hepatitis by hepatitis A, B, or C, and also an abdominal ultrasound. The second test that is recommended by the guidelines is a blood test to test for less common virus that are known to cause acute liver injury such as the Epstein-Barr virus, the CMV virus, which is the cytomegalovirus, and the hepatitis E virus, which is much less prevalent in the hepatitis A, B, or C. For individuals with suspected cholestatic damage, the first line test that is recommended is only the abdominal ultrasound, and the second line tests that are recommended are blood tests to make sure that there isn't any biliary cirrhosis, and also liver biopsy if it's needed. Now here are the list of the drugs that have shown to cause hepatocellular toxicity. As you can see, there is acetaminophen, Tylenol, which a lot of people use for inflammation and fever, as well as NSAIDs, especially naproxen, which is extensively metabolized by the liver. Antidepressants like fluoxetine can also cause delay. Blood pressure medications such as ACE inhibitors and ARBs, like lisinopril and losartan can cause delay. Ketoconazole and other antifungal medication can cause delay. Antiviral medications like abacavir, as I've mentioned before, can cause delay. And lastly, anti-tuberculosis medications, such as acinizide and rifampin. And these are the drugs that are known to cause cholestatic liver injury, along with the drugs that are known to cause a mixture of both injuries. As you can see in all three lists, I included medications that are very familiar to us, like blood pressure medications, statins for cholesterol, estrogen therapy, um, beta-lactams, which are antibiotics for infections, and anti-seizure meds. There is a long list of medications that are known to cause liver injury and if you're interested in looking more into those, you can definitely find them on Libertox for more details. Now here's how you monitor Dili. 
Highest Road is a protocol to help healthcare practitioners to monitor daily in patients who are at the highest risk of fatal daily. And it states that the offending agent or the agent that we suspect that is the offending agent should be stopped if the AST or the ALT level is three times greater than the upper limit of normal, or the ALP is greater than 1.5 times the upper limit of normal, or the bilirubin is greater than threefold the upper limit of normal. The FDA has also offered guidance to help us manage daily in patients. And the guidance states that the discontinuation of treatment should be considered if any of the first three criteria for the liver enzymes are met, and if the liver enzymes are greater than three times the upper limit of normal with the appearance of the signs and symptoms as mentioned earlier, such as fatigue, nausea, vomiting, pain or tenderness of the upper right quadrant, fever, rash, and eosinophilia. The rate of severity of drug-induced liver injury is very, very low. And even though it's really rare, complications may occur. Complications such as liver cirrhosis, which is pretty much the irreversible scarring of the liver tissues. And that progression from liver injury to cirrhosis may occur over weeks to months to years, depending on the prognosis of the disease. That irreversible scarring is caused by the death of the liver cells. And when the liver cells start dying, then you can see a rise in the levels of liver enzymes such as the ALT and the AST. And the next thing that we begin to see is that the liver is enabled to produce important proteins such as clotting factor. And when the body cannot clot, the patient begins to develop bleeding disorders and those bleeding disorders is known as coagulopathy. Other complications that we may see are signs and symptoms of hepatic decompensation. And that is when the body can no longer compensate for the adverse effect that the disease is causing in the patient. And those symptoms include hepatic encephalopathy, which is pretty much a decline in brain function that is caused by the liver failing. The liver is responsible for detoxifying and getting rid of ammonia. And when the liver starts to fail, there is a buildup of ammonia in the blood that causes this decline in brain function. Another symptom that you can see in decompensated patients include ascites, which is when there is a buildup of fluids in the abdominal region. And the last symptom, which is actually more severe, is acute bacterial peritonitis, which is the infection of that fluid by gram-negative bacteria such as E. coli and uh, Klebsiella pneumoniae and other gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. Treatment options for that acute infection include the use of third-generation cephalosporin, such as intravenous ceftriaxone, 2 grams every 24 hours, or 2 grams of IV cefotaxim every 8 hours, for a treatment duration of 5 to 10 days, depending on the severity of the infection. Liver transplant may also be needed in very severe cases. Lastly, for the treatment of DILI, there isn't any definitive treatment option that is available to treat DILI in all patients. The treatment varies a lot and depends on whether we know the offending agent or not. For example, for patients who took a lot more than the maximum daily limit for acetaminophen, a treatment option to treat that toxicity and to slow the effect of the liver injury is to administer an acetocysteine. The first action to take after the diagnosis of DILI is to discontinue the offending medication. Rechallenging to establish the relationship between the drug and the liver injury is not recommended, especially when the liver enzymes are greater than fivefold their upper limit of normal. But there are definitely some situations where rechallenging may be considered, especially when the patient is taking multiple medications, especially when a patient is receiving important health benefits from the medication and other treatment options for that specific condition are not available. To know more about drug-induced liver injury, I definitely recommend this source right here. Liver Talks provide the most up-to-date, unbiased, and easily accessible information to manage acute or chronic liver injury. And these right here are the references I use. If you have any questions at all, feel free to put them in the comment section below and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Thank you all for watching and I will see all of you on the next one. Take care.